Hello and welcome back. So we were discussing about different features of serrated flow and with regard to that we talked about seven features in the previous lecture. Okay then next let us go to the next feature of this serrated flow that is feature number eight and it says that you can also observe an inverse behavior with regard to the temperature and strain rate. So what we have seen in point number 6 and 7 is that when you increase the temperature the onset strain decreases and when you increase the strain rate the onset strain increases right so one with respect to strain rate the variation of epsilon c with respect to epsilon dot and the other is the variation of epsilon c with respect to temperature So in both of these cases, sometimes you can also observe an inverse relationship. That means this trend that you see, you know, will be opposite, right? So you are supposed to have this kind of behavior, right? As you increase the strain rate the onset strain or the critical strain will also increase. But in certain cases, you might also observe an inverse behavior like this. Right? which will occur at a particular strain rate. Similarly, in case of the temperature, under normal conditions when DS is occurring, then as you increase the temperature, epsilon C will decrease. But at times, you might also see the inverse. Okay beyond a particular temperature. And this inverse behavior phenomena has been explained by certain researchers with the precipitation behavior. So this is actually attributed to precipitation if it occurs during the deformation. Okay, because uh, precipitates will also have their own influence on the motion of dislocations, right? These precipitates also act as hindrance to the dislocation motion and therefore the movement of the dislocation as well as the solid atoms will no longer be same when the precipitates come into picture. 
right? Because the concentration will be affected. How the dislocations move, that will also be affected because now you have additional obstacles, right? And therefore, you know, that inverse behavior is expected. So that is one way to look at it. But uh, there is another school of thought which says that it is not really due to precipitation, but it again goes back to a complex interaction between the solute atoms and the dislocations or maybe, you know, other obstacles which may be there in the lattice when the dislocations are moving, right? So there are two school of thoughts with regard to the inverse behavior that you can observe sometime. One says that it is due to precipitation and the other school says it is due to a complex interaction between solid atoms and other obstacles and the dislocations. The next characteristics that is number nine is about the magnitude of these serrations. Yeah, so this delta sigma is the magnitude of this serrations and this increases with increasing temperature. This is again due to the fact that as you increase the temperature, the solid atoms can move faster and catch up with the dislocations easily and therefore you would need a higher stress for the dislocations to move again since they are locked by the solute atoms okay and that is why this delta sigma will increase as you increase the temperature number 10 is about the relationship between delta sigma and strain rate so with increasing strain rate delta sigma is going to decrease and this is again not difficult to understand this we have already discussed before as you increase the strain rate the dislocations will move faster and as a result of that the solute atoms will find it difficult to catch up with the dislocations and hence the delta sigma will decrease because dislocations can now move easily right so you do not need a higher stress for them to move and therefore delta sigma is going to decrease as you increase the strain rate. Number 11 is about the relationship between delta sigma and strain. Delta sigma increases with increasing strain. This is because of the fact that as you increase strain, you generate more vacancies. And as you know, the diffusion of atoms is actually assisted by the vacancies the atoms move from the lattice site to a vacancy and that is how the diffusion occurs right so if you have more number of vacancies the atoms can also move easily and therefore that diffusion will increase right so as the diffusion rate of the solid atoms increases they can easily catch up with the dislocations and lock them and as a result of that 
you need to increase the stress for the dislocations to move and therefore the delta sigma will increase okay so number 9 can be shown by this plot the relationship between delta sigma and temperature delta sigma increases with increasing temperature okay and number 10 is about the relationship between delta sigma and strain rate so as the strain rate increases delta sigma decreases the number 12 is about the concentration with increasing concentration of solute atoms the onset strain epsilon c decreases and delta sigma increases this is because if you have higher concentration of the solute atoms the diffusion will be also higher and therefore the solid atoms will be able to catch up with the dislocations easily and you can expect the onset strain to come down right and if the diffusion is higher you know the locking of the dislocation will also be higher and therefore the delta sigma will increase okay so this was all about the serrated flow or the dynamic strain edging this also goes by the name plc effect after the names of the people who actually developed this theory particularly for the aluminium alloys Portevin Leo Settelier okay so these are the names of the same phenomena dynamic strain edging serrated flow or plc effect dynamic strain edging can adversely affect the mechanical properties of the material for example as i would have mentioned before also in carbon steels Dynamic strain edging can occur in the temperature range of around 225 to 375 degrees Celsius and occurrence of DSA in such materials reduces the ductility quite significantly. and it also leads to a reduction in the toughness dsa can occur in aluminium alloys also
and the localization of the plastic deformation leads to what is known as stretcher strains in this alloys. And this is going to affect the surface finish. As these marks appear on the surface, the surface finish is going to be affected adversely. And when it comes to aluminium alloy, if you look at the solute atoms or the alloying elements, magnesium is one of the alloying elements which can give rise to dynamic strain edging. However, if you look at the diffusivity of magnesium in aluminium at room temperature, it is quite low. And therefore, the question here is to how does magnesium then diffuse to the dislocations to lock them down and give rise to this strain edging effect. Okay? So, there are few theories which have been proposed to explain this uh, diffusion of magnesium in spite of its low diffusivity in aluminium at room temperature. One theory for example says that the vacancies which are generated due to the plastic deformation will assist diffusion of magnesium. You might know that Diffusion of substitutional atoms like magnesium occurs by the vacancy mechanism. And what is this vacancy mechanism of diffusion? This is basically movement of an atom from a lattice site to an adjacent vacancy, which is depicted in this uh, picture over here. So, let us say we are talking about the movement of this particular atom, which is colored red here. So, here there is a vacancy. Okay? So, when the vacancy is available, this atom can jump into this vacancy and the vacancy will move in the opposite direction. right? So, that is how as and when the vacancies are available in the lattice, the atoms will move leading to lattice diffusion. Right? So, the strain induced vacancies will increase the concentration of vacancies and that will assist the movement of magnesium atoms for them to catch up with the dislocations and lock them giving rise to the dynamic strain edging effect in aluminium alloys. So, this is what uh, this theory says. Okay? But there are other theories which disregard the lattice diffusion because lattice diffusion also even if you have vacancies is not that fast right? and therefore, other kinds of mechanisms which are faster than lattice diffusion have been also proposed for example, diffusion along the dislocation core which is known as pipe diffusion has been also proposed as one of the mechanisms that can explain the diffusion of magnesium atoms to the dislocations. So, pipe diffusion that occurs through the dislocation core is much faster compared to lattice diffusion because the diffusivity through the dislocation core is orders of magnitude higher compared to that in the lattice. Okay? And therefore, such mechanism of uh, diffusion can easily transport the magnesium atoms to the dislocations for them to lock them down. 
So what happens in this case, if you look into little more detail, there are what is called forest dislocations present in the slip plane. So forest dislocations are nothing but dislocations which are moving through the active slip plane and interacting with the other moving dislocations. So when the forest dislocations cut through the other moving dislocations on the slip plane, it can hamper the motions of dislocations and therefore the forest dislocations can also act as obstacles to dislocation motion. So when the dislocations are waiting in such obstacles, pipe diffusion can occur through these uh, forest dislocations. which will lead to draining out of the solute atoms through the core of the forest dislocations to the moving dislocations, right? So that is how the solute atoms will reach towards the mobile dislocations. Some theories have also suggested that solute atoms like magnesium can also go through the process of cross core diffusion. So this model suggests that the solute atoms move from the compression side of the dislocation core to the tension side. So we have already seen before that the dislocation core has a compressive and a tensile strain field. The region above the dislocation line is the compression region and the region below it is the tensile region as shown in this uh, figure over here right so this theory says that solute atoms like magnesium will move from this upper portion that is the compression side to the lower portion that is the tension side okay so this way the magnesium atoms can easily move towards the mobile dislocations and lock them down. So you can see that such models can explain as to why magnesium can still give rise to the dynamic strain aging in spite of its low diffusivity in aluminium at room temperature. So due to its adverse effects, DSA should be prevented. One of the ways by which DSA can be prevented is by providing some amount of uh, plastic deformation. By roller leveling or temper rolling. Roller leveling is a method in which the sheet is bent back and forth
through a series of small diameter rolls. And in temper rolling, the sheet is subjected to a very small amount of reduction, maybe around 0.5 to 1.5 percent. So the plastic deformation through such processes will introduce enough mobile dislocations so that subsequent plastic flow can occur easily and the solute atoms will find it difficult to catch up with the dislocations and as a result the occurrence of dynamic strain aging can be prevented. But perhaps the best way to avoid occurrence of DSA is to avoid the strain rate and the temperature range in which it occurs. Right? So, if you are outside that range, this phenomena is not going to come into picture. So, let us take a summary before we wind up this lecture. So, to summarize, we can say that dynamic strain aging occurs due to interaction between a solute atmosphere and dislocations and it occurs in a specific range of temperature and strain rate and the effect is also known as PLC effect. Since the theory of DSA was developed by these two persons, Potevin and Le Chatelier and therefore it is also called PLC effect after their names and it is sometimes also referred to as serrated flow because of occurrence of those serrations in the stress strain curve due to this inhomogeneous deformation that occurs due to dynamic strain aging. And it is also manifested as negative strain rate sensitivity. So, in the range when dynamic strain aging occurs, the stress decreases with strain rate or in other words, the strain rate sensitivity is negative. Okay? And it has been also found that there is a critical onset strain for the occurrence of dynamic strain aging and that critical strain depends on strain rate and temperature. It decreases with increasing temperature but increases with increasing strain rate. And as far as the serrations are concerned, there are three types of serrations, type A, type B and type C. And the magnitude of these serrations depends on strain, strain rate and temperature. So, we have seen that dynamic strain aging can give rise to adverse effects such as reduction in ductility or toughness and sometimes it also leads to surface markings known as stretcher strain marks which will affect the surface finish adversely. So, therefore, it is necessary to prevent dynamic strain aging and it can be prevented by few methods such as by providing some amount of plastic deformation through processes like roller leveling or temper rolling and it can also be avoided by avoiding the range of strain rate and temperature in which it occurs. So, this was all about dynamic strain aging and with that we come to the end of this lecture, but there are many more to come. Keep watching.